Uh, I want you to turn your Bibles with me to John chapter 12. Let's say this together. In the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we stand upon the living Word of God, ready to receive its truth, be transformed by its power, and faithfully embody its teaching in our lives. And so we are on the run-up to, to Easter, and next week is, is Palm Sunday. And I was wondering, what was Jesus thinking? What was going on in the life of Jesus during the time, the week before? Knowing that Jesus knew his time would come. And Jesus was human. And so, knowing that the passion was going to happen, what took place? And in thinking about this, um, and many things happened. Jesus foretold his death many times. Jesus also had uh, challenged the Pharisees. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead um, just prior to that. And so many things were happening. But this is a pivotal moment. And, and you know that when you're going through pivotal moment, and God will always have you to go through a moment when you have to prove him for yourself. Mama is not going to be there. Daddy is not going to be there. A friend is not going to be there. You're going to have a Jacob moment. When your, te- your, your faith is going to be tested. And Jesus had to go through that so that he would know humanly what that felt like. Now, we, we're going to read from John chapter 12. I'm going to read from verse 7 to turn, and and what I'm going to talk about today is what I think is the greatest act of worship of all time. And I want you to turn your Bibles to to John chapter 12. And I'm going to ask you one more time to stand, just one more time, as we read this precious word. Then six days before the Passion, the Passover, Somebody say six days. days. Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped, hallelujah, his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas of Scariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This, he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what it was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial, for the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, may the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now I want you to come with me to a small, how many of you are from a small town? Small town folks are the best, warmest, nice, everybody's hand goes up now. How many of you from see me? Are you from a small town? Okay. <laughs> I want you to come with me to Bethany. Bethany, which is just a stone throw away from Jerusalem. Now, you must recognize that John chapter 12, just before, in John chapter 11, we read about the, the resurrection of Lazarus. 
Now, the resurrection of Lazarus was the turning point. It was the most phenomenal miracle that Jesus, in terms of impact that Jesus ever did. People knew Lazarus. And not just that, but they knew because they went to the funeral and they saw him dead. And it was, this was remarkable. It wasn't like many of the times when Jesus raised people from the dead, he healed the sick. It, it was not so much of a public event as this was. Because Lazarus' death, they had the, the time of his sickness, they had the time of his, his burial, and the whole community came together to mourn him. Look at somebody and say, Lazarus, Lazarus was dead, and Lazarus was buried. Now, you know the story. If you read it, if you don't, go back and read it. But when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, it did a number of things. One, it caused the Pharisees to recognize we have to do something about Jesus. And also, they, they had to plot to kill Lazarus. Let me tell you, the devil will always try to kill your testimony. Oh, I wish I had somebody here with me today. The devil will always try to kill your, the evidence of your testimony. And Lazarus, the news of Lazarus' death, it was like, it went viral all over the region. And so, now Lazarus was alive. When Lazarus was dead, bound in grave clothes, now he's alive and the news went viral. And so Mary and Martha decided to have a, have a party to celebrate Lazarus' uh, come back to life, his resurrection. And so they decided that it would be a good time to do this uh, just before the Passover. And so they threw a party knowing that Jesus, Laz the, a close family friend who often goes to, stays at their house, we know, when he was on his way to Jerusalem. If you've ever been to Jerusalem and you're going to come down towards Jerusalem, you get to Bethany and it's just a stone throw away. And it's a good place to rest um, before you actually go into old town Jerusalem. And so last, Jesus would often go there. And so they said, let's have a party. And Lazarus was the person who was the... Uh, uh, well, it is the person that they're celebrating at the party. So people came to see, is it true that Lazarus is really alive? They want to see, you know how people are when it comes to miracles. And miracles can be a dangerous thing when people start having itching ears just looking for miracles. And, and so they came in their numbers. And so Lazarus was, and this was Lazarus' party. Lazarus had a, had a story to tell. Lazarus, who nobody knew, now became famous. Lazarus was like a YouTuber that nobody knew. And all of a sudden they did something and all of a sudden they went viral. Everybody knew about Lazarus. So Lazarus was sitting at the table with Jesus. And this was six days before Jesus would face the Passover. Six days before Jesus would face the angry mob. This was just before Jesus would face death. And Lazarus was having a party, so Jesus came. And everybody, and even though everybody came to celebrate Lazarus, people were looking through the windows, people were coming in on their donkeys, people were coming by foot. There were people who didn't even know him came to the house, and, and the house was just surrounded by so many people. And Lazarus was so excited and said, look, I don't know what happened, but I was dead for three days, four days, and Christ raised me from the dead. He has a testimony. But Jesus, at the back of his mind, knew that he was going to have to face the cross. And I, and I want you to, 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 to see this picture of this great party taking place, celebrating Lazarus. And yet Jesus is thinking that after all these years of being born and being raised and three years of ministry, this is the moment where I'm going to face excruciating pain, I'm going to be insulted, I'm going to be killed, I'm going to, I'm going to face agony, torture. And, he's, and he's internally, 
He is wrestling, trying to put a, a brave face on for Lazarus, but he is recognizing that this is the week where I'm going to die. And it's interesting that in this moment, his disciples were there, and they were doing protocol, meeting people, saying, yes, I'm, I'm one of Jesus' ministers, and, uh, and, and everybody was there pontificating. But Jesus was sitting, I'm sure, thinking. But there was one woman who could see beyond the veneer. She could see beyond the, the smile that Jesus had. And, and, you know, and I want to talk to you about the lessons we can learn about worship from Mary. And this is what worship is. While they were singing and eating and having a great time, Mary was looking at Jesus and sensing. And, and this is what worship is, that it emits the singing emits the, the fellowship to keep your eyes upon Christ. Mary was focused. The disciples were distracted, but Mary was focused. And she looked upon Jesus and she, and she could see the act. She could see the, the concern, the reservation in his eyes. And everybody else was having a good time. The disciples were there. And Mary was not meant to be in the center of the worship. Glory to God. I thank God for the worship of women. That, that's me. Because my mother was a worshiper. And there are times when I saw her facing challenges that she would just break out into a song. And there was a, there's a sense in which she could feel the worship. She could feel the pull. And so I want to talk about, first of all, what is worship? Before we come to Mary. A.W. Tozer says, Any man or woman on this earth who is bored and turned off by worship is not ready for heaven. St. Augustine says, come, Lord, stir us and call us back. Kingle and seize us. Be our fire and our sweetness. Let us love, let us run. Charles Spurgeon said, nothing teaches us about the, the preciousness of the creator as much as when we learn the emptiness of everything else. Worship has been, says Graham Kendrick, has been misunderstood as something that arises from a feeling which comes upon you. But it is a vital that we understand that it is rooted in conscious act of the will to serve and to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. N.T. Wright said, the closer you get to the truth, the clearer becomes the, clearer becomes the beauty and the more you will find worship welling up within you. Craig says, Groeschel says, just as your body needs sleep, your soul needs time to rest in God. And so first of all, as we look at how, what, what can we learn from Mary? Mary, as you know, uh, while Jesus was sitting there, Mary breaks from the crowd. And Mary then breaks open the perfume that she had. I'm going to talk about that. And then she begins to wash Jesus' feet. And while she did that, aroma filled the place. So the first thing I want you to understand is that worship within a church community must be sacrificial. Worship will always cost you something. Write that down. Worship is sacrificial. The Bible said, Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil. Now, spignard was very expensive. It would be just like you, 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 you bring in a year's salary. In those days, in order to, uh, you, don't, you don't take your money to the bank. What you do, you buy something expensive and you keep it. So at the time when you retire, you sell it. In the same way, you have your 401k and you cash that in to get 
to get monthly salary. So, so Mary had, she seen Jesus and she knew that this was the week that Jesus would die. And amidst the crowd, Mary could see Jesus. And Mary, I can imagine, she, she goes back in to her room. And you can imagine where she hid this. Maybe it was under some clothes or some, you know, you know, my mother would hide things that you could never find it. Women have a way, mothers have a way of hiding things and putting things away. And so Mary would have undone something. She would have taken out this costly spignard. Now, spignard is something that was very expensive. It was a life savings. And she went into a room. And she knew that her Lord, she, she discerned that amidst the celebration, this was the last time Jesus would come to their house. Jesus often came and they laughed in the church. But she saw that this is the last time. You see, worship must be prophetic. It, it must see what God is doing. And amidst, and that's why I love Mary, because amidst what the disciples couldn't see, as they were thinking about becoming um, princes and taking over Israel, Mary saw that this was the moment that Jesus, the last time Jesus would come to their house. And Mary breaks out the spignard. Spignard is something that comes from India. Very expensive. And so what that teaches us is that then Mary took out a pound of very costly spignard and she anoints Jesus' feet. You see, worship must involve anointing. Worship must involve lifting up your hands and worshiping God and giving our, our, our best. Worship must cost you. It may, it may cost you your, your own self-consciousness. You say, I, I'm shy. Worship will cost you your, your self-consciousness. Worship will cost you that, 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 that what other people think of you. But if worship doesn't cost you something, and that's why many times we don't see miracles because we come to church and we don't give sacrificial worship. Sacrificial worship. But Mary gave Christ a sacrificial worship. Secondly, worship... It's about devotion. Heartfelt devotion before God. Mary's act of worship is not merely a ritualistic act or outward display, but stems from a heart overflowing. And I can imagine as Mary, you know, Mary had a, a history. She was a woman and she had a history. But as Mary brought the spignot, hallelujah, one translation talks, explains it that when she came in, everybody was there talking and laughing, and, and then Mary came. She, she didn't belong in that crowd because she had a history. She didn't come from anybody, but she came with a worship. You see, when you bring worship, and I can see Judas looking at him, what's she doing? Simon and Bartholomew. You know, everybody else is outside in the other rooms. The big shots are in this room. And here, here comes Mary. And as Mary walks into the room, people begin to look at her. What is she, where is she going? One thing about worship is that you have to get past people. Because as you lift your hands and as you worship, people will always want to look at your history, look at your past. But when you worship, you've got to forget about people. How many of you understand that when you worship, if you have to close your eyes, close your eyes. Because there's some people, when you look at them, and when they look back at you, they're telling you to sit down. Because I know what you were. 
So worship, the first thing, you've got to get past people. And I can imagine people were thinking that you used to be a prostitute. You used to be a woman of the night. You, uh, we, we know who you were. Maybe even some of the men in the, in the room. But Mary came in and she, she said, I don't, I'm not here for you. Sometimes when you come for worship, you have to let people know, I'm not here for you. I know that we had our beef, but I'm not here for you. I'm here to see Jesus. I know I have issues. But I'm here to see Jesus. Hallelujah. And so worship must be about devotion. Because one thing that Mary was, she was devoted to Jesus. Devoted. Focused. And in all of Christianity, don't get lost in the religiosity, in the religion of Christianity. Because Christianity is not just about religion. It's not a religion. If you think that Christianity is a religion, you missed it completely. Religion has never done anything good to, for nobody. It has caused wars, systems, traditions. It's dead. That's why Christianity is not just about, uh, it's not just a religion that you follow rituals and follow rules and regulation that gets you to heaven. Christianity is about relationship. And when Mary came, she said, I'm not here because of religion. I know you have your protocols. And I know that women should be at the back. But I'm here for Jesus. And if I'm going to have to get by you, I'm coming to Jesus. If I'm going to have to, even if you're staring me down, I'm coming to Jesus. Because I'm here because I have a relationship. And, and as Mary came to Jesus, she saw that Jesus would have been deeply concerned about what would happen to him. Only a few days. Mary understood that worship, particularly the worship of a prophet or a king, that whenever you come to worship or to, to install a king, there had to be something that is presented. Mary's worship was prophetic because even before Jesus died, she was anointing him. Other people were thinking about what I could receive, but Mary saw in that moment Jesus' death. You see, only when you have a personal relationship with Jesus can you understand and sense what he's doing. Yeah. Only when you have a personal relationship and Mary at that close proximity to Jesus. For, 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 for years she had prepared this room. For years she had prepared this meal. For years... She had, put, she had spread his bed and she knew exactly how Jesus wanted things. For years she had studied Jesus. That's what worship does. It keeps you focused. You don't get lost in the trappings. And so many people get so easily offended by things that happen in church. Because they're taking their eyes off Jesus. When you have your eyes on Jesus, people are talking about you and you don't even know. Gay, you don't even know that they're talking about you. When you have your eyes upon Jesus, people are looking at you and you don't even know because I'm not here for you today. I'm here because of Jesus and I've come to worship. America could say, I could see you looking at me, but I'm here for Jesus. And I wonder if we can just enter into that moment just prior to Jesus' death and to say, Jesus, we worship you. I know Palm Sunday is coming and Easter Sunday is coming. But today, as Jesus is suffering mentally, psychologically, emotionally, being tortured, I wonder if we, we can give him worship at this point. Yeah. 
I know that next week and the week after, everybody's going to come with their banners. Everybody's going to come on TV. But I wonder if there's a few prophetic people that will say, I'm not going to wait until Palm Sunday. I'm not going to wait till Easter, but I'm going to give God my shout from now. Jesus, you are king even before you went to the cross. Jesus, you are my Lord even before you raised from the dead. And I'm going to worship prophetically. You see, worshiping prophetically, this just came to me, means that I'm going to worship God even before the resurrection. I know my resurrection is going to come, but even when I'm before my breakthrough comes, everybody can worship when your breakthrough comes. Everybody can worship when you have your victory, but can you worship when you are going through hell and high water? Can you worship when you don't have any money in your pocket? Can you worship when people are talking about you? Can you worship when you don't feel good in your body? Can you worship when you don't have a way out? Can you worship even though I don't know how God is going to bring me out of this mess but I know that I'm going to still worship him come on somebody I need some people right now who understand prophetic worship people are asking why are you singing I'm singing because I know that I'm going to get out of this how many of you understand prophetic worship he said why are you worshiping it's not Sunday yet it's not the resurrection yet. I'm giving God a prophetic worship because I know Sunday is coming. But I'm going to give God a down payment of my praise right now. And if you're going through something, if you're going through something, I dare you to stand to your feet and to give God praise right now. And say, Lord, I'm not waiting for Sunday. I'm not even waiting for Palm Sunday. But I'm going to give you praise right now. Come on, somebody. Lift up your voices. I'm going to praise you right now. Hallelujah. I know they're going to come next week. I know they're going to come the week after. But can you give Mary's worship? Why Jesus has not risen from the dead. And while you have not overcome your challenges, can you begin to worship God right now? Worship God prophetically. Worship him for what he's about to do. Come on, lift up your voices right now. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. you something when Mary came and she opened the spit nut and people saw what it was it it, it would be like somebody giving a two hundred thousand dollar Rolex watch and laying it on the altar it's somebody going to the bank and getting and, 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 and withdrawing their 401k and laying it at Jesus' feet. And somebody's looking at it. But when worship, when Mary, when they saw the box and they knew it was spignant, and everybody began to criticize. Let me tell you something. When you worship her, you will always be criticized. When you worship, somebody's not going to like you. But let me tell you something. Gail, I want you to know that as soon as she opened the box, And the aroma, the aroma, the fragrance begins to lift. Somebody said, what is that? What is that? What is that? What is that smell? What is that smell? And all of the critics, you see, see, worship will change the atmosphere. All of the people that were criticizing you will be silenced in the presence of worship. Because when when the aroma lifts up, it's the power of the Holy Ghost arising and letting people know that God is going to be glorified. The Bible said when the aroma lifted and all of a sudden the atmosphere changed. Let me tell you, if your, if your home is filled with argumentation, if your home is filled with whatever it's filled with, you can change the atmosphere 
atmosphere of your house. You can change the atmosphere of your workplace. You can change the atmosphere of your office. How? Just begin to worship. Just begin to worship. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, somebody. You need a change in the atmosphere. You need to change the atmosphere. Worship. Worship changed the atmosphere. As she worshipped, and the aroma went to God, the atmosphere changed. The atmosphere. And I wonder, as we are the people of God, as the worship team comes up, whatever your atmosphere, you are the embodiment of worship. Wherever you go, let your atmosphere continue be conditioned by you you must be the the thermostat not the thermometer come up worship leader I wanted to spend moments and to give God a pre-easter worship we want to enter and let me tell you something even sinners are going to come and worship on Easter Sunday it's Super Bowl everybody come even those people who don't care about football come to Super Bowl you hear what I'm saying? This is what I'm saying. Even those people that don't care about football. Are, my wife loves, don't, in, the, in, the, in the, the season, she don't care one thing about Super Bowl. About, about, about football. But come Super Bowl Sunday, she is the world expert. She tells you everything she needs to know. She's got all the colors. Like many of us, Super Bowl is going to come in a couple of weeks. But if you're, the, if you're a true fan, you don't wait for Super Bowl to come. If you're a true fan, even when your team is down, you're still going to come and celebrate. And if you're a true fan of Jesus, you don't need to wait until Palm Sunday where everybody's going to be waving palm leaves. You don't need to wait for the Easter Sunday when everybody's going to enact the resurrection. You don't need to wait for Friday for, to, to commemorate Jesus' cru crucifixion. Even everybody's going to be wearing a cross. But if you are a true believer, you can worship God like Mary and say, I'm going to worship God and Mr. Quietness. I'm going to worship God even though it's not in party. Even though this is not in occasion. I'm here to worship. Come on, somebody. I'm here to praise him. I don't care what time it is. I don't care what time it is. I don't care what time it is. I'm here to worship. Look at some I'm a 24-7 Give me some more volume on this. Look at somebody else. I'm a 24-7 worshiper.
from falling. To the only wise God, our Savior. To him be honor, glory, dominion, power. Be with you now. Get ready. Be with you now. Now and forevermore. There is no rival. Come on, give me that song again. 